I've been blessed in my in my career to to have this many shows that have been this popular and have such resilient, dedicated, loyal fans. It's you know a lot of a lot of actors don't have that. There's working ac actors out there who you know have successful careers and stuff, but they haven't been part of uh, shows that have a really like active and uh, 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 loyal fan base such as this one, you know? It's rare. There, there are fan bases, but they're not like you guys. <laughs> you guys are a special, special group. And what's even more fascinating about this group in particular, and really blew me away with the last convention I did, um, was how many new fans I saw. You guys, I've been doing these conventions for 20 years. I've never, there's always like, you know, it's my first time. And you're like, oh, welcome, welcome. We all talk about it. It's like, oh, there was a bunch of new people today. But when I say a bunch, I mean like, you know, there's six or seven or maybe under 10 new fans who've come to check out a con for the first time. The last one I did, my God, man, there were so many. I've never been to a convention in 20 years of doing conventions where I saw that many new fans. And, you know, it's not a bad thing. That's a great thing. It means the show is still alive and active and new fans are taking it in and, and loving it as much as you guys, uh, you know, so much so that they're deciding to come to these conventions and be part of the family. So we should embrace them and, uh, and be uh, grateful for that, I think. Hi. Hi, Tom. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. Um, as a fellow British Columbian, I'm just wondering what your favorite thing is to do in our amazing province. Oh, I mean, there's so many. So many. There's so many. Let's be honest. We just, uh, one thing most of us do is just take in the beauty all the time. You, you know, we live in a city, but you can just go down to the seawall and uh, be fascinated by the ocean and the view. Because I was born and raised in the north, nowhere near the ocean, as soon as I moved to BC, I've, I've, always been fascinated um, and just awestruck by the ocean. Uh, I lived in Kitsilano for almost 17 years, and no matter what was going on, you know, good or bad, especially bad, I'd go down there and I'd sit by the ocean, down on the beach, and I'd just get clarity. It just feels like it cleanses you, yeah, you know? Yeah. It's one of the most beautiful things, but it's such an incredible province. You know, I'm an active guy, I like snowboarding, I spend a lot of time in the mountains, mm -hmm. and then in the summer I spend uh, a lot of time outdoors. I live in the Okanagan, so... Where? Uh, I live in Vernon. Vernon's beautiful. It is, so I, I like to go down to Cal Lake and just sit on the Oh, beach. man, I love Same. Lake Country. Love it. It's beautiful. It's I just agree. a beautiful thing. Good for you, man. That makes me happy. Thank you. Me Enjoy. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, I was super excited to see you on Supernatural because I loved you as Hilo on Battlestar. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So oh, I'm wondering why, um, actually, do you like playing Ezekiel or Hilo better and why? And which set did you like being on better or which cast did you like working with better and why? <laughs> wow. Pick your favorite kid. A lot of pressure here. Um, you know what, they were very different things. This show is so special to me and I had an amazing time playing an angel. A very wounded, conflicted angel who was pretending to be another angel at first, you know. It was quite a unique journey, and it'd be hard to compare them to, you know, the role that I played as, as uh, you know, Carl C. Agathon. It's very different, just very different characters. Um, you know, Battlestar is a very, it's a dear experience uh, for me because that journey was almost five years long, and um, I worked intimately with all these actors and the creators of the show uh, on something that today is still one of the most critically acclaimed television shows ever shot, especially in the sci-fi realm. And I, yeah, thank you. And I don't, I don't take that for granted, ever. Like, I'm more proud of it now than I ever was. Because as I get older, I think I, I'm still finding new ways to appreciate that experience and learn from it, you know? Hilo and, you know, Gadriel were so different. They were so different. But uh, the supernatural experience has been incredible also. I just... I don't really want to compare them because they're 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 each uniquely beautiful in their own way. Because of only doing one season, five, six, six episodes of playing a character, I'm pushing ten years of doing these conventions with you guys. You know what I mean? 
I think it's nine, ten years. Nine years at least. It's just like a, just like that. I remember when they started. I remember the day that the my first scene that I ever shot, and um, I, I'm I had some stuff going on in my life at the time that was very challenging. But the kismet of it all, the the timing of you know, I, I don't want to digress too much, but as actors, you know, we're, we're taught. Um, and you have to remember, even in the tough times, life, life's always there. Life doesn't stop for, you know, your biggest performance or a important role or what have you. You know, grandma can pass away, your child can get sick, an animal dies right before you go to work. But in our industry, you go to work. You, gotta, it, you have to do it. And I personally was going through some stuff right before my very first day of playing uh, Gadriel. And um, I remember thinking like right before I got to set, like uh, that day I was like, it was just really stressing me out. It was really stressing me out and I remember just trying to focus. And then I remembered, like I actually thought back to an active teacher and just them really impressing that upon us. Like you, you just embrace that, you use it for your work. And I had an incredible day on set that day because I was able to use it. So I have so many specific memories um, and uh, experiences on each of the shows, but I, I keep them separate. You know, they're, they're each a beautiful thing for me. And I just feel uh, very wealthy and, uh, and uh, happy that I've had those individual experiences. And I'm still experiencing this one in this capacity. I feel very blessed. Thank you. Hello. Hi. I was curious about what your favorite scene shooting on the set would have been. You were talking about that the first scene was very powerful for you. I'm wondering if you have a favorite that you shot. Um, yeah, I, you know, there was more than a few. Um, but Jensen and I, when we had the scene where he's got me tied up and he's basically torturing me, kind of interrogating me, it's not a very long scene, but it was an excellent scene because Jensen and I really got to, we got we we got to get into it, you know. I love that kind of acting. I love you know like a raw performance, and I've said this a million times, but one thing that really impressed me about those boys is a lot of lead actors they get so good they become like kind of you know journeymen because they've done so many hours of television. But they can, they can, some actors can tend to dial it in a little bit. They don't, they don't give you a ton of, you know, when you're acting with them. Or they, unfortunately, will be quite selfish and they make sure that their performance, like when they're on camera, is bang on. But they're not reciprocating when they're performing with you. And that's really sad because the art form of acting, it's, it's about that give and take. It's the dance, right? That's how we bring it out of each other and that's what's expected. Like, you know, give me something to work with. And uh, that, you know, that was one of the first times that I got to work in a significant capacity uh, with Jensen, like a really good scene, and he brought it, man. He brought it, and I loved it. I just loved it. I, ca I can't wait to work with him again in the future. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hi. Hi. I, first of all, I just need to say, you're still doing this after 10 years because we love you. We love you as you. And we thank you. As, as all your characters, so... I really appreciate that, that's kind, thank you. We wouldn't be here thank if you. we didn't love you, so... Thank you so much. <laughs> um, really, I just wanted to say that um, I'm watching season now again with Ezekiel and Gadriel, and um, I'm just in awe of how you, you play Ezekiel, and we, we like Ezekiel, <laughs> because he's helping Sam, and then you, you turn to Gadriel, and Gadriel is, is just so negative and bad at times but you also pull out something that's sad in Gadriel because obviously he made a, this huge mistake um, and nobody's ever ever forgiven him for it and he's never forgiven himself either um, and I just wanted just to say that to you but also to say how did you how did you go about pulling that out of somebody who um, forced Sam to kill Kevin um, went on a killing spree in the end um, and also, I wanted to ask you, apart from the tied-up scene, what was your favorite scene to film and why? Well, that's like a multi-part question. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the compliments Sorry. in the first, first part. That's okay. And then, um, um, sorry, what was the second part briefly again? The 
second part of the question was apart from the tied up scene, yeah. because that's that's one of my favourites. Is there another scene that was your favourite or one of your favourites <laughs> and and a, a little bit of information about how you went about filming it? Oh yeah, now I remember what you were asking. You were talking about the different layers and the, the how how I played it. Um, let me answer that part first. So again, back to you know acting school and the way we're taught. I, you know, I was always taught when I was in acting school too, like you, to play a character like just as a bad guy is a, a very one note. You, you as an actor always have to approach things as, as if you're, you know, you, you, you're believing in what you're fighting for. There's got to be a strong choice there. And, and with Gadriel, even though he was not being forthright or honest about who he was, he, again, he's a, I've used this many times, but I feel like he's a wounded soldier. You know, he, he was dealing with a tremendous amount of guilt and, and uh, not trusting the situation that he was in um, when he started to realize that Metatron was steering him wrong. Um, I just played it with conflict, you know? I try to make that choice, to make it clear, even though they weren't writing it, when the camera was on me, I was showing any opportunity I could where I was like, okay, I'm not, you know, Metatron may be telling me to do this or saying this, but I'm not sitting there nodding my head and agreeing, you know, with him. And just by doing that, you know, the writers are kind of forced to take it in a slightly different direction. And if not, the audience at least, you guys have a little bit more sympathy for the character. I can show you, even without changing the dialogue, that there's a different aspect to this guy, that he's conflicted doing these things that are wrong. Yeah. Um, I had so many good scenes that uh, I did in the show, but you know, I've talked about this before too, but even the small scene that I had with Misha where we're in the car and he's talking about like some, he's talking about Star Wars or something like that. He, uh, Misha's like the, the, the angel in the know now. He's cool, he knows what's up and he's, he's talking about socially relevant things and entertainment or what have you. And you know, Gadriel's just got this puzzled look on his face. I thought that was, there was so much room for comedy there, you know, if we had more scenes like that. Unfortunately, we didn't get them, but I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed the brief time that I got to actually work with Misha together. Thank you so much. You guys have to excuse my voice, it's a little, uh, little rough today. Hello. Hi. I was wondering, um, Battlestar, uh, when you signed on for the reboot, did you realize, A, that it was a reboot, and B, whether or not, or how big a legacy that you were stepping into? I don't think anyone knew what kind of legacy we, the show was gonna end up being, maybe other than Edward James Olmos. Like Eddie was talking from first season, he's like, you guys have no idea how important the show is gonna be. It, even before first season was done, he's like, people will be talking about the show 20 years from now. And he was completely right, 100%. I mean, the last three, four years of show has been arguably talked about and written about more than it ever was. It's fascinating. Did you it's, watch the original? I did. I did. I'm old enough to do that. I'm 47, so I was. I was. I am. I was a little guy because I think it was nine. I think it was 79, 80. Yeah, I was small. I was small, but I remember because I actually have a really good memory, and I remember a lot of my childhood, even when I was like four. I remember a lot of stuff from when I was that young. And I remember the action figures, because I had some, like I had a Cylon. Um, I had uh, I had Boxy, the little robot. I had, I, I was right into it. Um, I remember how big it was, or the potential of it anyway. And I, I really remember, like in terms of episodes, I remember, uh, I remember the, the next season that they tried to do, that was kind of like the spin-off thing where Starbucks down on the planet with the, with the Cylon, they're trying to survive together. I really remember that. And it was funny because when I, when we, when I got the role, we were, um, you know, you, I hadn't read the script yet when I got the role. I, I had the sides, it was an excellent audition, excellent sides to work with. But we went off to do this military boot camp which was really amazing to give us like camaraderie and really give us a sense. The director really wanted us to have a sense of what it's like to be in the military. He wanted that to be a legitimate thing that the actors were conveying when we worked on set. And uh, 
it was incredible that we did it. But I think at lunch, one of the days, we were sitting in the mess hall, and uh, they put on the original pilot. We got to watch it while we were eating lunch. It was weird, you know, going down memory lane and seeing that after, you know, 35, 36, 37 years. What percentage of the people do you think had seen it? Or was a new viewing for them? There was a few of us who were, there was a handful of us who were, you know, around my age or a little bit older. So a few of them had seen it. I think Aaron Douglas had seen it. I feel like Jamie Bamber had seen it. Jamie, Jamie's got a year on me. Um, I'm not sure that Grace saw it. Grace and I are the same age, Grace Park. But I, don't, I think it was the first time she'd seen it. Yeah. Did they have some really good reactions to seeing the pilot? I mean, aha moment? you know, not to be disrespectful in any way, because I think Gary Larson is a genius coming up with that idea. Um, and it was really, you know, I think it was quite impressive in his time. But, you know, a lot of things don't date well. You know, even at that time, the, you know, it, it just, it looked dated, you know, in terms of the special effects and things like that. You could see that. So I, I like to just remember it for what it was and how relevant and cool it was at the time. But it didn't, for me anyway, it didn't date that well, you know, and and then when we started shooting our show and where we were at with even CGI and the writing and where Ron Moore took it in a different direction and really opened it up. Uh, you know, Battlestar was, without a doubt, there's no controversy about this, one of the first real cable shows to open up a whole, all these streamers we see now, all this incredible television that's being written now is as a result of, you know, the shows that really set the precedent, like, uh, you know, The Sopranos, Battlestar, uh, uh, West Wing, uh, you know, um, Six Feet Under, there was a handful of shows that started out back then that really, like, opened up this new era of streaming and writing, this incredible era that we're in where there's just you can't even watch the amount of good stuff that's out there. It'd take you a lifetime. I personally can't keep up. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. First convention, first time in Vancouver. I came from Utah. So. Welcome, welcome. <laughs> Very lovely here and rainy. Love it. It's yeah. great. It's, it's totally a mood. Um, but my question is, you have a very... Um, uh, specific cadence the way you talk it's very unique and it's very memorable is there was there any coaching or anything with Jared like how to pick up on that you know I'm sure he you know obviously he's talented so he picked up on that but anything specific we didn't know each other very well um, before we started playing the first character I met Jared a few times at uh, the UFC fights because we're both big fans and and uh, my best buddy Alex had worked with him before and, you know, introduced us and we had a quick conversation, but it was always, you know, it was just about the fights and we were right into it. And he was just such a sweetheart. You could always tell that. But when I ran into him on set, there was just a very brief conversation and it was just about like, hey, welcome to the show, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I, I honestly, I've told this story many times too. I thought I was going to be playing him first. That's what I was, that's what was communicated to my agent and told me. So I'm like, I'm, I'm okay, I can do my thing. And then I guess the lead of the show has to kind of follow suit or do whatever he wants, right? So when I went to set that, you know, the day and the director was like, hey, do you want to see what Jared did? And I was like, oh yeah, what do you mean? With Jared, Jared did what? And he's like, well, you know, playing Gadriel. Like, and I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm, I, I, what? And he's, he's like, well, yeah, we, 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 you know, we picked up a scene the other day, so he played, he did the scene. And I was like, I, I, I was told that I was going first. Are you, are you okay? Yeah, that's probably like a good idea. And so, I mean, I've told this so many times, but it's, it was just ridiculous. Drop that on an actor, like five minutes. I'm like, how much time do we have? He's like, five minutes. I'm like, oh wow, okay, five minutes. Yeah, thank you for that. I'd like to kick you right in your thigh right now. Let me see what the effing lead of the show did, because, yeah, I'd like to not get fired after the first episode. But thank you for having so much confidence in me. Uh, well, heck, yeah, you did a great job. Yeah. Uh, the, no reverse credit well, he, you know, one thing to Jared's credit, he was, he was very specific in the way he was doing a couple things that were falling in line with, luckily, with choices I had already made. So it kind of worked. But, you know, what I did take on was he, he was very specific in his physicality and the way he was moving 
and I tried to amalgamate that into what I was doing, and I think that helped. Yeah, absolutely. You did an amazing job. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Hi, uh, my question is very similar to that one, except it was specifically about the, the cadence of your speech. I found that good, the way that Gadriel spoke had like a very specific rhythm, um, and I thought that you and, and Jared both, uh, like you could really see Gadriel come out when Jared was doing it. So mm. you're saying that you had to do it second. So you, did you have to like, did you pay attention to that cadence or? You know, the funny thing is, in the scene that I saw, um, when I really think about it, J Jared wasn't even really speaking. <laughs> he wasn't speaking a lot, but he was very, his, his movement, his physicality was very specific. I think he said a few words. I'm just saying it wasn't like he had a monologue or something where I was like, oh, okay, yeah, there's, you know what I mean? I made a choice just because of how old Gadriel is, how old these angels are. They're from a different time and so they, they wouldn't speak like a modern day person there would almost be a Shakespearean sort of iambic pent pentameter uh, rhythm to it there'd be a it would almost be a little you know it's it's um, what's the word I'm looking for it would just have a different cadence I, I imagined it being a little bit more of a of a different era and uh, there'd be a different uh, rhythm and style of speak and maybe even volume and uh, I, I experimented with it a bit when I was doing it. You know, there were times where the way the scenes were written weren't, it didn't seem really appropriate for it. So there were adjustments, but you know, I, I think it, it just kind of became what it became early on and it, it worked. And I think Jared's probably again, you know, as I spoke to before, these guys are the craftsmen. They've done thousands of hours of television, man. Like it's, it's you know, it's easier to make adjustments that, you know, they got the, let's just say Jared and Jensen have their black belt. It's impossible not to get a black belt in, you know, television acting when you've been doing that many hours of television. So he made adjustments, I think. I think he probably took on some of the stuff I was doing and uh, adapted it. And, and, you know, you guys were happy in the end. So that's, that's really all that counts. <laughs> So he did the physical, you did the, the language, and it just... Yeah, I mean, I could sit here and lie to you, you know? <laughs> I could say that... Yeah, Jared Jer Jer was struggling, so <laughs> he was struggling, and uh, so he approached me, and I put him through the rigors and uh, training session for a week. I took him to a cabin out of the woods and deprived him of food and water because he needed it. He's been pampered. He's a lead actor on a show, and yet just, in all honesty, coming from the acting school that I come from, he's gotten quite soft. So I took him in the woods. Took all his clothes. I think I've read that fanfic. You, you read that one? Yeah. Uh, left him his underwear and socks. And then we went through a very Stanislavski style acting camp for five days where I worked on his cadence and speech and mannerisms and everything amazing he did was because of me. Thank You're welcome. You. You're welcome. He promised me that I would never tell anyone this will be my last convention. <laughs> it's been a slice. Thank you so much. Hi. Hi. Uh, I wanted to ask my friend and I are flying to Whitehorse next week, and I know that. Are you really? Yeah, so we're going to do a week in Whitehorse. Do you have any excellent tips that might not be on TripAdvisor? Well, quickly, what are you, what are you planning? We're doing, well, the Northern Lights. We've got four nights actually in Whitehorse, and Beautiful. then we're on the Inn on the Lake for a few days. You're going where? The Inn on the Lake at okay. Marsh Lake. Okay, Marsh Lake. Okay, yeah, that's not, you know, it's an hour outside of Whitehorse. Um, I mean, it's just such a beautiful place. You're, doing, you're, you're heading up for the number one reason that tourists, and I say that with all respect, because I'm a tourist sometime myself, for travelers yeah. head to the Yukon as they want to see the Northern Lights. So I'll, I'll pray for the Northern Lights for you, the beautiful Aurora Borealis. Um, Marsh Lake is stunning. It's incredible. You know, it's... Are you renting a vehicle, or are you just getting toured around? We're just doing the tour, but we might get a car because we've got some time, so... <sighs> oh, man, where do I start? It's really difficult around this time of year, too, because it's getting cold, and they just got snow, which is going to bode well for you in terms of the northern lights. Yeah. But, you know, many hikes or things that I would tell you to go check out, eh, it's yeah. a, little, a little more difficult now. 
Um, there's a place called the Hot Springs that that is 40 minutes outside of Whitehorse. It's uh, down the Takini Highway. Yeah. And if you have an opportunity, and it's I think it's now open again. I grew up going to that place as a child, and a German family ran it. It's this amazing, like it's not amazing, but it's this. It's uh, it's natural hot springs that they turned into actual pools, and it's way out in the sticks, outside of Whitehorse, and it's really a beautiful sort of calming place to go to. And I heard it's open again. Yeah, I went, The last I looked, it was closed. So yeah. Is it still closed? Um, but I haven't oh, checked shit. recently, so. Yeah, Maybe. and then you know the the Kwanlin Dun Cultural Center. Kwanlin Dun is the the main uh, First Nation, one of the right. biggest ones, right in Whitehorse. They have this stunning cultural center right right along the water. Make sure you walk along the Yukon River, downtown Whitehorse, right along the water. And uh, there's an excellent little coffee shop there called uh, I think it's called Baked, and that's a good place to start off your day. Um, yeah, just walk around. The waterfront is really stunning now. I was just up there. Uh, weeks ago. Um, it's a beautiful place. You'll like it. It's a charming little town. Excellent. Yeah. Enjoy. To That's so cool you're doing that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi. Hi. First of all, I just want to say I love your jacket. It's awesome. I love your jacket. Thank you. Um, I want to ask, here's a good one, if you could bring Gadriel back from the dead, how would you do it? How would you do it? <laughs> Um, I would probably bring him back in a later season when no one else expected it. <laughs> That's good. That's good. There's a future creator here. There's a storyteller right there. Um, exactly. There, it, there, there would have been ample opportunity for that, or even the next season, or even two seasons afterwards. Like, I don't know where Gadriel shows up. I mean, that would have blown the fans away. I think that would have been super cool. Um, yeah, that's, that's the coolest thing about this universe, and, you know, I think part of the reason the Supernatural fans like it so much is there's there's always a possibility for anything to happen, right? Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Thank you for that. Thank you. Enjoy the show. Hello. Hi. So when you did work on Castle, what's your opinion on Nathan Villian, and would you want him to work with you on Supernatural one day? Say the first part of the Nathan Fillion thing? What's your opinion on Nathan Fillion? My, my opinion? Yeah. <laughs> I know Nathan. Yeah, he's a friend. Uh, Nathan's extremely talented, obviously. I mean, um, he's got a crazy work ethic. He, he, you know, he went from Castle, which ran seven, series, seven seasons, and he was one of the leads. That requires an incredible amount of tenacity and professionalism. You can't do a series that many hours a day six days a week because you know when you get off work friday it's saturday um you have one day off for seven seven years without being a really committed professional i like nathan he's incredibly witty it's funny he's got a real dry i appreciate his humor because uh, the british side of me is just like it's, he's, he's almost got like a british wit i think both his parents are teachers he's very bright nathan's very bright he's got a funny dry wit and he he loves taking the piss, man. He's a, he's a funny guy. Michael Truco, who's a dear, dear friend of mine, is very close with Nathan. So when I go down and see the Trucos, we often stop by Nathan's, or if he's having a function, we'll go there. He's a, he's a cool guy. Um, and obviously doing really well with his new season, too. Uh, so what was the second part of the question? Would you ever want to work with him on Supernatural if it came back? Yeah, of course. I'd work with Nathan in any capacity. He's a, he's a talented guy, man. He's, he's very good. I still remember the first time I met Nathan. I was aware of him, um, and I knew about him from uh, you know his work with Joss Whedon. And, um, and then I met Nathan at a... I still remember meeting him. He approached me at an uh, entertainment weekly party at uh, San Diego Comic-Con. And he was really kind, and he was just trying to impart some uh, advice on me as a you know new up and coming actor. And uh, yeah, I still uh, I still still remember that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. So, as somebody who wants to get into the business myself, what advice do you have for any aspiring actors? Um. I mean, there's a few things. I, I, how old are you? Do you mind if I ask? I'm 14. Okay. Yeah. I mean, you know what's incredible right now? You have the capability 
in your phone of making a movie. That's astounding. I, and, and I say this with all respect, but I don't think, I think you might take that for granted. It's hard for you to have the perspective that I have. When I started this professionally 20 years ago, you couldn't do anything like that. Nowhere near. You can edit, you can film, and upload. You can do most aspects of making a film 4K quality even if you want, or 1080p at the very least, on your phone, on the most basic digital phone these days. That's an incredibly powerful instrument that you have there. As a creator, as an actor, just create. Make little movies. Just because you want to be an actor doesn't mean you shouldn't test your skills as a, as a creator, as a filmmaker. Play the director. Get a couple friends together. Get a couple actors together. Shoot a short two minutes long. Upload it. Why not? That's what everybody's doing now. We're living in a completely different era. It's like people can become famous and outside of that, because that shouldn't be you know, the, the main focus that is driving you. It's because you want to create. Make films, work, do things. Don't ever become complacent. If you get to the point where you're auditioning and you're getting out, or maybe even you've got a bit of a professional career, during the slow times, create, do stuff. Get back to class. Do a play, make a film on your phone, just create. Keep busy, Work. Treat, treat it like being an athlete. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And good luck. Hey, Tomo. Um, Hi. So, I, I love all of your work, of course, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention how much you scared the crap out of me in Dublin, Ohio. And, thank you. And how deep did you have to dig to <laughs> to portray a character like Malachi? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you, thank you for the, the compliment. Um, you know, I actually did an interview with CBC a couple days ago that you should check out. I just posted it today. And uh, I talk at length about my research into cults. And uh, I think you'd find that interesting. Any of you, if you guys, if you guys want to take 10 minutes, and it's a really good interview. It was good, there were good questions, and I think I was just kind of feeling it that day. Um, um, but you know, I, I just, I've always been the actor if there's an opportunity for it, which there was with Malachi and Devil in Ohio to do the research. I, I've, I've always been curious about cults regardless. I think most of us are, they're pretty fascinating, right? You know, the idea that people will, can be so attracted to these things and, and, uh, can be somewhat so invested in them and, and, you know, they, how they, how they can just kind of. Well, they usually attempt to move away from uh, mainstream society and do their own thing. Um, but this one was particularly interesting because, you know, it's a, not to give away anything in the show, I'm sure you can guess it, but it's, you know, it has to do with a satanic cult at that. And that's some scary stuff. That's some interesting stuff. So I, I went down that rabbit hole a little bit and I, I studied and listened to many different podcasts and did some reading specifically on cults, uh, many of them around the world. And I was just trying to narrow down the, the, the attributes and the specific things that I at least could discern that was one of the main things that attracted people across the board, you know? I think oftentimes with these cults, and even today, right? at any stage in society, when, when you're an individual who's feeling like you don't, <clears throat> excuse me, you don't have community or, or, um, or a tribe per se, you know, groups like this kind of prey on people like that. It gives them that sense. So you, you can understand how they can attract and recruit people early on and how effectively they do it. And, um, yeah, it's, just, it's a fascinating subject. I could talk on it for a very, very long time. I just, uh, Devil on the Hire was a good experience. I wish we had more more to do, you know. Um, I really wanted to sink my teeth into the character more, but there was only only so many scenes to do that. Uh, but it was a really good experience, and uh, I worked with some amazingly talented people, and the show was, even I think 10, 12 days ago, was the second most watched show next to the new Game of Thrones. 1.3 billion minutes watched according to the Nielsen ratings so it's done really well and that's impressive because I can tell you right now that show probably had a 20th of the, of the, the budget of Game of Thrones if that if that
Well, thank you for the research that you do because it shows, and as uh, fans, we appreciate that. It makes you a great actor. Thank you so much. I appreciate those words. Hi. Um, sorry, I will try to make it work. Uh, English is not my first language, so I will try to make it clear. You're that. speaking it very well. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I've heard like most of the times when actors play uh, characters on TV or, or movies, they usually uh, get something from the character, right? Because they, as you say, they play the character. So what do you think is something that you get from Gabriel when you were playing it and that you think that like you're carrying it over? Mm, that's a really interesting question. It's really good. Well, for instance, after I finish Devil in Ohio, I'm, uh, I'm definitely going to start my own cult. <laughs> I've decided that's a good idea. No, I'm, I'm joking. I say that respectfully, of course. Um, yeah, Misha did. <laughs> Misha definitely did. <laughs> and very effectively. I... Misha. Man, that guy. Um, yeah, it's, I mean... I think when you're playing a character like Gadriel, for instance, like you said, you, you, you obviously have to explore certain aspects of your own personality that you can bring out in it. You know, you've got to, as actors, we're trained to, to find uh, circumstances that we can use, substitutions that we can use to emulate the emotions or the experience or the struggles that our character is having. And to the layman, like to the non-actor, it might not make any sense at all. Like, you know, I might be worried about my taxes and, you know, I've got, I've got a big scene with, you know, Kadrill is fighting against Metatron or going against them. Well, I'm, I might specifically be using that substitution, those goddamn taxes. <laughs> but I'm doing the scene with Metatron and you're seeing, you're going, that, 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 that looks legit. He, he looks pissed off and stressed out. What you don't know is I'm worried about my taxes. <laughs> I, my point is, is you always got to bring aspects of your own life in there. And I mean, if there's if there's one thing that I took away from playing a drill is, you know, I'm the type of actor like I really I, I want to I want to be as present as I can when I'm playing the character. I like dropping in and staying there as much as I can. There's always a part of you that has to, of course, deal with you know sound or the director talking to you or what have you. Uh, you know, you, you're but I, I, I want to sit in it. I want to sit in the experience. And, and, um, and because of that, going on that ride with Kadriel, like, I feel like, I, feel like I, I, I know what it's like. I have a, I have a sense of what it would feel like to have um, been him and, be, and feeling so alone. Do you know what I mean? He had no community. He didn't feel a sense of belonging. He was a man, he was a soldier who needed a purpose and he didn't have that anymore. He lost his honor, so he was struggling. He was always trying to find a place again and trying to find purpose again. And I, I felt like I really sat in that at times and it was really a sad, lonely place. Yeah, but I had a lot of sympathy as a result for him, you know? Yeah, thank you very much. That was very deep. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. So as you were saying earlier, Gadriel was a very conflicted character. In many ways, I was wondering if there was ever a time in your life that you kind of pulled infer like inspiration from to play him. Yeah, well, I think I was just speaking on that, right? Like it's um, that's what we do as actors. You take from your own life, right? And 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 uh, there's times where you 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 don't even know it, but something that you're dealing with, good or bad, can be just perfectly relevant and like to use uh, in your work um, and sometimes it surprises you like sometimes you're on set and for whatever reason the scene isn't cooking it's not it's not organic it's not you're not feeling it and sometimes you have to you have to make a choice uh, uh, try something that that's not something you would normally use like try and start off with using thinking about a very happy experience in your life and using that even though the scene might be very much about duress and stress and struggle, but use that happiness to drive you, to give you the energy to start the scene, and it might take you to where you want to go. Do you know what I mean? Yes. You have to experiment very much in, sometimes when you're struggling to find a scene, and that's you know what a good actor and a good 
director will will help you with and also you know the actors you're acting with you know you can you got to play you got to take you got to take risks thank you thank you hello hi good to see you as always you as well um looking for a rec uh, restaurant recommendation for tonight what kind of food you what <laughs> kind of food not, not something super fancy, just... You know, you know what the problem with that question a nice, is? nice, good, solid, mm, now I'm feeling fat and happy. And oh, things. man. <laughs> the, 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 the problem with that question is kind of like when people ask you, hey, what are your favorite films? And you kind of draw a blank. Like, I get that sometimes in Vancouver. Usually not, because the city is filled with so much good food. It's so much. You, you know what I'd say off the top of my head? Um, do you like Italian? It's not super fancy Italian, but I'll give you two places. They used to be sister restaurants. I'm not sure if they're connected anymore, but there is Tavola, which is excellent food, and it's the end of Robson and Denman, Tavola. And then there's Nook, which is the same type of thing, but there's one in Kitsilano, and I love Kitsilano. It's right by the water. Nook is just on, uh, it's right on U Street, which is right by the Kitts Beach and stuff. So that's easy to get to, even if you're staying downtown. That's a, you know, 10 minute Uber ride. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's it, guys. Um, listen, it's always a pleasure. Thank you so much, guys. Have a blast this weekend. I'm super excited to be here, and I know, uh, I know you guys are going to have a great time. Sorry, we were late. That's okay, man. <laughs> you know what? The timing was perfect. We had the last question. She finished. You guys sauntered on. It all works. I can listen to your dulcet tones all night, though. Yes. Well, you gotta pay for that shit, buddy. I will. <laughs> I'm starting a call. So you ladies and gentlemen, Tom Penicam.